Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you would like to uh, check out previous ones, go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com. And you'll notice the alphabetical index page there is under construction. It's a big project that I'm in the middle of, but it works. And you can find all the interviews through that. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and would like to support it, uh, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. My guest today is Caverly Morgan. Hi, Caverly. Hey, Rick. Great to see you. Good to see you. Um, I met Caverly at the Science and Non-Duality Conference last October, and she's one of these people who, when you meet her, feels like someone you've known forever. Um, and I think you, you all who are watching will get that feeling too in the course of this interview. Um, she gave a presentation there on a program that she started in the Portland public school system teaching mindfulness to kids and it was a fantastic presentation. She was in tears half the time, the audience was in tears half the time, the kids were in tears half the time. <laughs> it was a big sob fest. But it, it was just a tissue box opportunity all the way around. But it was really beautiful and everyone was thinking, oh God, I wish I'd had something like that when I was in high school. Um, and so it's wonderful work she's doing, but she's multidimensional and has a lot more going on than just that although that in itself is a wonderful thing. So we're going to be exploring all these things in the course of this conversation. Um, maybe before we do that, I'll just read uh, the kind of formal bio that she sent me, or at least bits and pieces of it. Um, Caverly is a, a meditation teacher, a nonprofit leader, and visionary. She's the founder and, and guiding teacher of Presence Collective, dedicated to igniting personal transformation and collective awakening. She is also the founder and guiding teacher of Peace in Schools, the thing I was just referring to, a nonprofit which created the nation's first for, for credit mindfulness class in public high schools. Caverly blends the original spirit of Zen with a modern non-dual approach. Her practice began in 1995 and has included eight years of training in a silent Zen monastery. She has been teaching contemplative practice since 2001. Prior to her pioneering efforts with Peace in Schools, Caverly formerly worked for nonprofits serving people with special needs. She also speaks publicly at conferences on topics including contemplative practice, social entrepreneurship, authentic leadership, and mindfulness education, and has been featured in publications such as Mindful Magazine, um, The New York Times, and probably others. I was going to crack a joke there, but I couldn't remember the name of that supermarket tabloid that you always see. <laughs> some throwaway that something inquirer. Yeah, one of those things. <laughs> no, she hasn't been in that. Um, Not yet, yeah. Rick. There's yeah. time. Right. There's time. You might sh show up there with your arm around Bat Boy or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's dedicated to actualizing possibility, serving love, and embodying the truth of interconnection. So, here we go. Um, and Rick, um, since you sent me a link right mm -hmm. before we started our call, I'm just now going to close. Can I close my inbox out now? Yeah, you can close your email. Then other people won't have to listen to the dreaded email ding. Oh, the ding. ding ding coming in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. All right. There we go. Okay, great. Thanks. So you sent me a, uh, you haven't written a book yet. I guess you have one in progress, don't you? It sounds like it. I, uh, I, I would love to say that I have the kind of spacious lifestyle that has me still in a hermitage somewhere writing a book or being quiet all the time, but I, that is so not my life now. And, yeah. uh, and if I pull a book off anytime soon, it'll be because we've got folks transcribing an online course I did. And it's, mm. so that transcribing process has begun, and then we'll see how much work it takes to to turn that into a book. I hope I hope that it happens. Good. I sometimes think about it too, but for the same reason as you, hardly ever get a time. I don't even have a time to check all the emails that come in. Um, but there's a lot of material of all these interviews. Could could put something together that excerpted all sorts of little passages from various interviews and Absolutely. organize them by different themes and you know, yep. threw in a little commentary from me for what it was worth. We'll see if that ever happens. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I do want to mention um, before we jump into anything else, I, I really appreciate what a service you provide. Well, I feel that this ongoing conversation uh, about the nature of consciousness benefits so many more than we could even know. And just my 
gratitude to you for holding well, that you. flame. And you know, it's a group effort. Group effort. You've already dealt with Irene and Jerry, and you know, there's various people who uh, we've got a fellow in London watching this right now, forwarding questions during the interview. Which is a reminder to those watching live: if you have a question during the interview, you can. Uh, Post it on the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and it'll come in. Um, but and then there's a, one of my best buddies from high school named Ralph Preston does all the video post production. He's been he's done all 450 something of these and, uh, just as a labor of love. And there's a fellow up in Canada named Larry Kelly who does all the audio post production. So there's a whole team of wonder. There's a wonderful woman named Mary Salama that it, it transcribes a lot of the interviews. So it's this kind of group effort, you know. Yeah, it takes it's a nice village. To, yeah, and it's nice to acknowledge them because they are behind the scenes. So yeah, it's with nice a lot of podcasts, you hear at the end they, they say, "Oh, this was made possible." And all, they name all the people who are involved, like you listen to Krista Tippett or something. But mm -hmm. I don't usually do that, so it's nice to mention them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, as I recall, I don't know whether you t said this in your talk at Sand or I, I talked to you privately later, but there was some whole story about you escaping the Zen monastery in the dead of night. <laughs> Uh, you know, without any money or phone or anything else. Um, I'm sure that there's kind of a, some interesting developments leading up to that, so that might, you might want to backtrack a little, but maybe this whole Zen monastery phase of your life would be a good place to start? Sure. Or how you ended up in the Zen monastery you know, in the yeah. first place, because I considered joining one myself back in the 60s and uh, then took a different course, but it was something I thought about doing. Hmm. Well, I never considered joining one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just wasn't anywhere on my radar. I grew up in central Virginia, and I didn't know any Buddhists growing up. And I ended up in a Buddhist monastery because I met a woman who um, embodied something that I'd never seen before. And what was significant about that was again, it was a contrast to the conditioned reality that I was so seeped in. And and what it was, was that this woman, Sherry Huber, was deeply present. And I just hadn't seen that type of presence. I hadn't experienced firsthand that type of presence. I'd had these little glimpses. I was, I was a potter and uh, I watched someone throwing a pot at one point and I, I had one of those moments of water, clay, present moment, um, just dropping into awareness in a way that was surprising to me in that moment and I had no words for because I, I didn't have this language. Um, but uh, yeah, so I met Sherry Huber, which was interesting in and of itself because... Is it, I just want to say, throwing a pot is a potting term. It doesn't mean someone they literally threw oh. one. It, <laughs> it means that it's, they, they created one. That's, you call it throwing, right? Thank you. That's yeah. really important to clarify. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, you have this rather not quite violent as romantic image. <laughs> <laughs> if someone's throwing a pot. Um, yeah, it's not the Buddha in the hot coal story. No, right. it's, it's uh, yeah, there's that lump of clay on the potter's wheel. Spinning and around, it's yeah. Spinning around, quite organic, quite beautiful, yeah. requires tremendous presence. Mm -hmm. um, Think of using the movie Ghosts. The, yeah. Right. yeah. Bru Bruce Joel Rubin, whom I interviewed, was the screenwriter for that. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. So I, it's, it's actually, it even begins, um, before I met Sherry, the reason I met her was somewhat interesting because I had traveled around the world for a year studying ecology and social issues through the international honors program. And a friend there had given me a book by Sherry, that which you are seeking is causing you to seek. Hmm. And, uh, that book affected me tremendously. And I didn't know because I'd been given the book that I was then on this mailing list for the monastery. So the way I met Sherry was that I got this flyer. Remember back in the day when you get a flyer in the mail yeah. about going on a retreat. Mm -hmm. So I got a flyer in the mail and, uh, I talked to some friends. I was working at Innisfree Village, which is a community for people with special needs. And I was a full-time uh, volunteer there and art teacher. And I got this flyer in the mail and I talked two friends into going down to this Zen retreat. And uh, that's where I met Sherry. Um, meanwhile, it is interesting to note that I hadn't read the fine print, didn't know it was going to be silent. Um, my friends and I truly had no idea what we were getting into. 
there was, uh, I think we had beer in the car. <laughs> um, we thought we would be rooming together. It just sounded nice to go and learn to, how to meditate, but I just, I was, I was pretty clueless. But meeting Sherry, um, being around someone who had dedicated uh, their life, their life to being practice was was profound for me. Even that first retreat was a tremendous opening. And then, of course, I on that first retreat, it never occurred to me that I would someday be a monk. And, um, you know, organically, I, I began to choose jobs that would allow me to have enough free time to go on retreats until the point that my boyfriend at the time was like, OK, you're or are you joining a cult or something like you? You, you know, the, he he suggested that I was kind of obsessed with it at the time, and I think I was. I think I was just really hooked. So I'm pretty yeah. obsessive myself. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to be obsessed with something, being obsessed with how to be more awake in the world is not the worst obsession, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> I actually. Uh, this is a, this summer will be my 50th anniversary of having learned to meditate, and I've never missed one in, in all those years. You know, twice a day, an average of two, three hours a day. So my my slogan is OCD can be your friend. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm sure there's lots of details you could tell us, but you ended up in this monastery full time. So I ended up in the monastery. Right. Um, it's I, I I really didn't know I was going to go for eight years. I made a six month commitment. The the idea was to go for six months and then move to San Francisco and meet a dancer and have a have a life that just incorporated practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I even remember knowing Do you have a that specific I was, dancer in mind, or just any yeah, dancer. You no, know, I would have I would have taken some specific ones at the time, but um, <laughs> it was just this vision of a particular life. And yeah. I I actually it's funny that you asked that because I remember even thinking, and I'm going to get a dog named Dakota. Oh, okay. Like funny. it was you just, had it all worked out. I had it worked out, you know. Yeah. And kids were in the picture somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then after six months, uh, you know, I was asked to recommit or leave. Yeah. And I remember being deeply torn, mm -hmm. really just suffering deeply over what to do because I knew I hadn't even scratched the tip of the iceberg regarding what was possible for what I was doing there. Yeah. I knew I had gotten a taste. And and so I, I flipped a coin. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Yeah. I was sitting outside the meditation hall and I remember so clearly flipping this coin and thinking, well, if if it if it lands and tells me to leave, I'll do two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you something. Yeah, it really tells you something. And so I really did want to stay and surrender to this process. But I, I needed I needed that uh, that encouragement. I needed I needed someone something to say, yes, you can, you can do this. And then I committed year by year Yeah. beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's a good and, way to do it. Yeah. The running away story that you're making reference to was just one of the many times I was having a identity crisis, complete meltdown, um, moment of suffering. So was the there anything wrong right? with the place? I mean, it was, were you being mistreated in any way or you were just kind of like, going through some, something and just decided, yeah. yeah. Not mistreated in any way at all. Okay, I yeah. just trained in a place in which there was nothing to distract you. We didn't have, this was a very formal setting. There was no eye contact. Uh, there was a lot of sitting every day, total silence. In fact, so much silence that um, I, I've never been in a space since where yeah. the silence is that penetrating is 320 acres in mm. the middle of nowhere and um and and i i was so there in that environment there's just nothing to keep you from being with whatever experience you're having and so often in my training that that included my I own think... struggles bringing awareness to my own struggles yeah I was wondering if we're going to have to have a, a dog break, but I think Irene will get it under control, hopefully. It means there's a rabbit outside. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I've got two downstairs, so they might start any minute, and then we can just have a chorus. Yeah. 
<laughs> Did you ever hear about Julian of Norwich or Norwich or something like that? I just heard this story yesterday. Um, she was this woman who had herself literally bricked in to a small little enclave in, in a church in, in England and lived there for something like 40 years, never getting out until the day she died. They, they were able to sort of hand food into her and, you know, but talk about making a commitment and, and sort of uh, going the distance. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, mm -hmm. so you left the thing, and it's probably a, an interesting adventure story about how you, you left in the middle of the night and went, you know, over hill and dale, and I don't know if we need to spend our time going into it, um, but I guess it must have been time for you to leave. Well, that little runaway story that you heard mm -hmm. um, in one of our exchanges was was actually just very brief. It was just a, a, a moment of struggle that manifested with me feeling like I just can't do this anymore and walking off the property. But yeah. I was I was back by the end of the day. Oh, OK. Yeah. No. Yeah. After the um, after the eight years, um, my my departure was really about a type of integrating into the world that that little leaving the monastery for x hours during during the day and ending up coming back at night um i mean i never even interacted with another person because i was in the middle of the nowhere so it wasn't that was just a little yeah little little drama little in the middle of, yeah. yeah 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 well it's some something that we could touch on briefly but you know when you're on a long retreat like that stuff comes up and um you know, that has been sort of cleverly repressed or concealed or whatever, but stuff starts to bubble up. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, the, the Beatles wrote that song, Dear Prudence, when they were in Rishikesh, and they were all doing this long meditation program. And if you ever read Prudence Pharaoh's account of what she was going through, it's pretty wild. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've been on a lot of long courses like that. So I don't know, it's just interesting to touch upon how these sort of long, intense, focused retreat type situations can really stir up deeper things than mm -hmm. more th than easily come up in ordinary day to day life. Yeah, and that's it's it's one of the gifts of an environment in which everything's supporting yeah. being with your experience. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then generally you have to just hang in there and not take the impulses too seriously, like. I should leave or I should marry this person or, you know, I think I'll shave my head or whatever. It's like it's like you have to kind of like realize that these impulses are just some kind of release of something and, and not pay them too much mind. But they can be quite convincing at times. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the gifts of a setting like that is it it forces you to ask yourself how how am I going to be with myself in this moment? There's no one to save me. There's I can't change the externals yeah. as long as you've made the commitment that you're not going to leave you know just because you're having a hard day uh, so that's sort of off the table it's like a, a yeah, you marriage. can't just go to a movie and distract yourself or no, something you, you have no, to kind of face it absolutely it's like a marriage to practice so yeah. that you know you know you're in it uh -huh. and then the question just becomes what what will i do in this moment will i will i just stew on this story for the next 20 minutes and suffer mightily over it will i will i continue to try to hang on to being right uh, instead of being free mm. will will i drop it will i will i um, give myself the gift of returning to presence rather than stirring up even more uh, internal drama for my own entertainment or whatever for the ego's own entertainment yeah. of course yeah one thing this brings to mind is something one of the first points you put in the notes you sent me uh, your relationship to the progressive path as well as the direct path and mm -hmm. um, I tend to be more of a progressive path guy myself I think in terms of my own practice and in terms of my understanding and you know most of the people I encounter who talk about direct path as I understand it, and I actually moderated a panel discussion at Sand last year about this, but I keep running into people who, who say things like, well, you're already enlightened, just realize that, no need to practice anything, you're, you're done. And, and that seems to me like just a fantasy. And, and whereas, I mean, real, really deep transformation is necessary over a long period of time for 
you know, the kind of physiological, psychological, spiritual metamorphosis that the word enlightenment or awakening really signifies. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what do you say to that? Well, I say that my experience is similar to yours in that I can speak to the benefit of a progressive path. Mm -hmm. I also can speak to what you just pointed out regarding being in situations where I watch people in the room lost um, when someone, a teacher says, you're already enlightened. I watch, I watch that not land. I've also been in rooms of people where due to the skillfulness of the teacher that has landed and it's been quite powerful. Mm -hmm. But I, I, as I, as you know about me, my, my current passion is allowing space room for all approaches. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm so in my own practice is so um, affected by my experience of being on a progressive path. And yet I'd never have the experience of existence in the way that I have an experience of existence in this moment, if it weren't for having come ac across Rupert Spira. Yeah. He, and he, he was my introduction um, to a direct path. <laughs> I actually once got Rupert to confess that the direct path is progressive. Uh, we'd have to we'd have to pick up that conversation again. But he was he was getting into a car and to rush off from someplace, and we were just saying goodbye. And uh, I sort of you know he kind of like acknowledged that. But <laughs> but um. And there is a thing of you know cultivating a mentality where you're forever chasing the dangling carrot, and you you kind of get it into your your mind that you couldn't possibly be anywhere close to anything significant and you've just got to keep cranking it out you know and in the hope that someday you'll arrive and that someday never arrives because partially because of that mentality that you've set up so there's some kind of happy medium or balance or or something between these these two perspectives yeah it seems to me when i consider my own experience for example being a monastic mm -hmm. That even towards the end of my stay at the monastery, I still was identified with with the spiritual seeker. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to be doing a good job. I had a certain definition of karma in my mind, and I and I was very focused on trying to. In at that time, I would have used the language "burn through that karma." Yeah. And, and I feel very uh, much like the biggest hindrance of that period I'm able to see in hindsight was that I was, I was stuck in that phase of practice where awareness has been separated from the object. So mm -hmm. you, you become that which is um, watching. Right, and, the witness. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that feeling felt like some kind of eddy. I knew I knew I wasn't free in that, though I had had many experiences of many fleeting experiences mm -hmm. of freedom. Um, in fact, the more fleeting experiences of freedom I had, the, the more my temptation, my conditioned temptation strengthened to try to maintain those experiences. Yeah. Um, and so that really um, l allowed the separate self to have a full time job. <laughs> and it, in, it's, it's been an incredible gift for me to have my practice supported by an approach that really invites a person to recognize that none of that actually was required. Mm. Um, that I mean, we hear it all the time, but th but that that we are that which we're seeking. Ironically enough, coming back mm -hmm. to that book title, um, the the place that I am currently passionate about as a teacher is recognizing that it's possible for us to use skillful means to bring in whatever's appropriate for a given moment, and. That's my my passion for that is one of the things that allows me to be so grateful for the time I had at the monastery, because even though that's I don't wish to create a monastery, I would certainly never create a monastery that modeled that structure. Um, I don't have an interest in um, uh, a, a type of guru model. It's not the way I set up um, my 
uh, organization. And, and I, at the same time, couldn't be more full of gratitude that there's so many tools um, that might support someone depending on on where they are. And 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 one of the things that I I appreciate so much is all these tools can be they're applied differently if they're coming from the direct path understanding that we are awake. We are c- consciousness. The those tools are affected energetically even by not bringing a mentality of here's the tool and in a subtle way I'm suggesting a self-help program I'm suggesting that you through these practices will get better and you'll you'll get to have this special exotic experience of enlightenment mm-hmm. if you apply these tools yeah well, I have several thoughts here um, one is just referencing my own experience I went through decades of sort of this yearning, seeking, enlightenment, or bust kind of feeling, you know. And I think it was largely due to the fact that there was just a a lack of inner fulfillment, you know, that it just hadn't matured enough. And I wasn't ever one of the people, one of these people who just have this sudden night and day transformation, but gradually over time that just dissipated, and I never feel that way anymore, Um, you know. And yet, I still consider myself a work in progress, um, you know, uh, by very much so. Um, but somehow the, the progress, and, and obviously with the, what I do, it, it shows a, an enthusiasm for this kind of thing. It's all I think about practically. Um, and, uh, well, pickleball, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, that too. Um, but Our spouses it, keep us real, Rick. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of done on a different platform now. It's sort of done in, mm-hmm. in the sense of adventure and exploration and, yes. and curiosity and learning and all, as opposed to kind of a you know a, an emptiness uh, that once drove me. Can you relate I think to that? You're, absolutely. I think your point is excellent. That there's a difference. You know, I think desire gets a bad rap in practice. People people say, oh, desire, that's that's so bad. But the, the place we suffer, of course, is when we assume lack and the desire arises out of that assumption mm-hmm. of, of lack. But in my experience, there can be tremendous desire that arises out of the love and the recognition of our shared being of, of oneness of of our inherent awakeness, and th- those desires have a very different quality. That, for example, might be the desire to um, dive into a new tool that could be of service to someone who's coming at practice through this door. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I I I these days like you get extremely lit up by hearing new forms, new practices, new things that might resonate with someone who comes from a background different than mine. I mean, I I meet so few people who have an interest in going and becoming a monastic. And like I said, I didn't either. But um, but there's so many people who are looking for uh, a need, a type of of resonance that's that. what a what a beautiful thing to just have tons of tools in our tool belt so that 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 resonance can be found. Yeah, I like to say God is not a one trick pony, you know, and um, just look at the fecundity of nature, the diversity and mm-hmm. abundance, and and uh, you know, and why not in human endeavors, including spirituality? Why shouldn't there be just a, a plethora of different practices and approaches and you know tools, as you say? Yes. Yeah, and as as you point to, it just mirrors the abundance of everything of, of consciousness. Yeah. Really, the, the the outpouring of of love and possibility that consciousness is. So, for me, uh, I, it's never felt um, truthful to um, to choose one one thing. Yeah. It's never felt like it's in integrity with my my direct experience of 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 something that's so vast and infinite. The the possibility that's consistently um, and forever uh, arising in consciousness. Yeah, but even there, it's like 
to say, I mean, there might be people for whom it's appropriate to just have one thing and stick to that. And, and we would be violating our own statement here to say that they shouldn't do that. That would be a one thing kind of mentality to say that they shouldn't have one thing. <laughs> um, so there's that old saying about, you know, digging one deep well, right? I was just going to offer that image. Yeah, but how about 10 tools to deep one, dig one deep well, yeah. you know? Well, I, I, I think it's a fair point mm -hmm. that we have to, there, there is some kind of middle way there that in, especially in this culture of, I can just taste this and then I can go yeah, over here and taste this and then I can yeah. take, yeah. And, and we've seen, you know, for example, um, uh, the, 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 the shadow side of that, um, I'm suggesting more and obviously having been dedicated to one particular approach for, for eight years, I can speak to the benefit of just not leaving that path in that practice. But I'm suggesting that once there's some kind of recognition of our true nature, then why not allow any, any, um, any opening that can assist another in having a similar recognition to um, come into our to our uh, our use. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a couple of wrap up points to what we were talking about a few minutes ago um, regarding the seeking thing. Um, Patanjali, you know, who wrote the Yoga Sutras, he he sort of classifies yogis in terms of mild, medium, and intense, and he says those who have vehement intensity will realize most quickly. So there's something about determination and zeal on the spiritual path. So you know, this whole thing about seeking doesn't necessarily imply that one should be lackadaisical and blasé yeah. and just, you know, it's just going to happen if it happens, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think one of the most powerful things that happened for me when I came upon Rupert's teachings was hearing him consistently, and he'll, he confesses now that he was throwing this out specifically um, for me in these in these uh -huh. initial moments because he saw me I mean I came in with so much discipline it wasn't even I wasn't even thinking I was trying to be disciplined I just have, I'm so it was so ingrained in me to have such discipline at that time and to have a teacher suggesting um, that discipline wasn't required was was huge mm. for me and I can't help paying homage to the fact that there's something that served me about having been disciplined for yeah. a long time, yeah. that it was powerful for me to hear that I could release the discipline, perhaps primarily because I, I had received the benefit of discipline at that point. I knew how to steady my attention. I knew I didn't, I didn't need that object focused meditation in that moment. Uh, and he he really recognized what I what was of benefit. Yeah, for some reason, images of musicians are coming to mind now. You know, there's that old saying about somebody walking up to Rubenstein or somebody like that on on the streets of New York City, saying, "How do you get to Carnegie Hall?" And he said, "Practice, practice, practice." <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, and yet, when one reaches that level of of expertise, one can then sort of cut loose a lot more and be more creative and and free flowing, or, or even like a jazz musician who. Um, you know, by very its very nature, that that form of music is improv improvisational. Has to do a lot of dis disciplined work in order to get to the point where he can really improvise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 again, I'm so interested in the fact that I I think there's a different medicine for each of us in each moment, even that. Yeah that for one person, the most helpful thing, one person I'm working with, the most helpful thing might be um, in addressing the trauma that keeps arising to have a steadying the attention practice mm -hmm. and to, to, to focus on that. And of course, it's offered again from the understanding that that their trauma is actually a creation and it's illusory, but it wouldn't be as skillful to say to this person who comes to me, well, your, your trauma is just an illusion. That's, that's not, it's not skillful and it's not accurate. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you deal with kids who are like suicidal potentially, or, you know, have had that sort of, that sort of feeling that they want to kill themselves. And, you know, you just to, to brush them off and just say, Oh, it's just an illusion. You're already enlightened. That would be downright dangerous. 
It would, and I find that it's dangerous with the adults that I work with too. Again, mm -hmm. there's a way in which one of the things I love about the teachings of the direct path is in the way that I've received them, there's an invitation, a beautiful open invitation to simply embody what those teachings are. That's the directness for me. The directness is that the vibrant, alive consciousness that is is everything um, is is we can we can be that knowingly mm. as we offer perhaps a new meditation technique to someone or as we talk to um, the Portland Public School Board about uh, expanding our program, or again, as I work with the adults that I work with, some who have had practice experience for 20 years and some who are newer to, to any kind of uh, meditation. One of the notes you sent me was skillful means and compassionate concessions. Is mm. what we're talking about right now related to that point? To me, it is. Uh -huh. Compassionate concessions is uh, is one way, I think, to talk about recognizing that, you know, let's say I'm working with someone who's had a really traumatic childhood and is very much stuck in their story. It's, it's, a, it's a compassionate concession knowing that, that the story is a complete fabrication, albeit a fabrication that's um, of the same consciousness that, um, that you know, is able to be aware of the story. It would be, it, it's a concession to speak to that person as, as if there's more reality to it than there is. And yet it's in that moment, I think it's not only skillful, but potentially deeply kind. Yeah, so is the point you're making that one wants to sort of teach at the level of the listener? Is that what you're saying, of, mm -hmm. of the student? In other words, you know, there's a saying in India that when the mangoes are ripe, the branches bend down and people can just easily pick them. Um, so is that what you're kind of addressing here? Well, you have one of your notes here, the importance of meeting another person where they are. Yes, and, and here's what I'm seeing about it for myself as a teacher. Meeting someone where they are doesn't mean ever that you need to abandon your own direct experience of knowing yourself as awareness. Right. But you might speak as if um, you, 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 might, you might tailor your experience such that you're not even talking about that direct experience and that might be useful or helpful to so, to someone is that does that feel clear to you or yeah yeah resonate? there's a there's a line in the gita where lord krishna says something like the wise do not delude the ignorant they they in, you know they even if they regard their, in their own experience that they are not doing anything whatsoever and they're, and they're completely detached from the world of activity and all they engage in activity and they they sort of do their dharma and they they set an example and and they kind of interact with people appropriately according to the that person's perspective and orientation yeah yeah, yeah. um what was this point that you made the relative in relation to the absolute. What would you like to say about that? Hmm. Hmm. I just thought it'd be interesting to see where you and I were, would go, given mm -hmm. that I know that something we have in common is this love for exploring the, the deliciousness of um, that most vast, absolute fundamental nature of consciousness mm -hmm. and uh, the, par the part correct me if I'm wrong that I believe we have in common is um, a, a, a type of passion for recognizing that it, we need not leave behind what's happening on the relative plane in, in as we adore the exploration of the absolute yeah, no, I agree. Um, and 
there are some, it, and you can cite examples of people like Ramana or Papaji who didn't leave that stuff behind either. I mean, Papaji was an avid, avid soccer fan. He would, especially when India and Pakistan were playing with each against each other, he'd be re rooting for India. Um, or you know, Ramana would read the newspaper and listen to the radio and keep up with current events and. Um, you know, which is not to say he was about to go out and start a business, uh, you know, or <laughs> pull a rickshaw or something like that. He had his dharma as a teacher, which was, you know, incredibly valuable for the world. But um, this whole theme of taking refuge in the absolute to the exclusion of the relative and brushing the relative off as illusory and insignificant and unimportant and uh, and that is, is a theme that comes up often in, in these interviews. I, I don't think it's a fully matured perspective, but it does, it, it is a, a, a sort of a, a, a pitfall, I think, that some people get into along the way. I did too, and I and it and it it's been a pitfall of my own. So I can I can speak to it intimately. You know, I I know that place where it felt like there was a split in my in my self slash perception um, that that there was the absolute and there was a relative and I didn't know how to reconcile. You could say going to a monastery was one way of saying I I will not engage with the relative. I had no idea what was going on in the world unless the work director posted a note. We communicated through notes. It was that silent wow. at this monastery. So, you know, there might be a note on the message board that said the Twin Towers have collapsed due to a terrorist attack. Uh -huh. And that was your news. Wow. <laughs> that, You'd want to know more. <laughs> you, you were left wanting to know more just about um, every day yeah. for some reason in that monastery. And again, what you were always asked to sit with is, what's it like to want to know more? Can you be with wanting to know more? Yeah. But but there was this, I, I, I didn't know, I didn't learn through monastic training how to recognize, um, excuse me, um, reconcile the absolute and the relative. Mm. And one of the reasons that I think that's true is that I, I left that monastery with that split still as a perception. And, and, and it's not just that through practice we can hold both, it's that when we recognize that it's all the absolute, and I know you talk a lot to people about the, the consciousness only model, you know, when we recognize everything as the absolute, then there's no reason not to move in whatever direction is the most authentic, authentic outpouring of your greatest love and understanding. And for me, that happens to be some type of engagement on the relative plane. So, uh, you know, caring about um, whether people of color are represented at a conference or caring about uh, what's happening to the animals. Uh, on our planet, caring about what's happening to our planet at large. Yeah, no, I totally agree, and I'm, I'm real passionate about those things too. Um, I guess it, it's good we're talking about this because I think it's just good to get it out there in the public understanding that I'm, I have this thing about you know defining what enlightenment or awakening actually is, and um, you know both for myself and for my audience, and just to sort of popularize. Uh, an understanding of it, not my understanding, but you know, to explore different people's perspectives on it. But I think it's really valuable that we have that a, a more mature and detailed and nuanced understanding, because if that's what all of us are interested in, those of us who listen to a program like this, then it's good to know what it is, you know, and and not to mistake some kind of half-baked version of it for mm -hmm. the real thing, because we dip, we shortchange ourselves if we do that. Um, go ahead and respond to that. Well, one thing I just wanted to say is, as you were pointing that out, that seemed, it's, it's, it's what you're talking about is so rich, and it, it just it strikes me um, it strikes me that we also make enlightenment so exotic. But at the end of the day, even someone who's not going to watch your show, Rick, I know there are just a few people on the planet that probably wouldn't want to watch your show. I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure the majority of the world would, but 
really, in all seriousness, those that wouldn't want to sh watch the show, don't they too seek enlightenment? That not that might not be the way they talk about it, but if you're looking at a a, a, a desire to to address that perception of separation, I think that every human has that. Mm -hmm. They they might be, um, we might get so confused that that's what that call actually is, that we might try to meet that call through all sorts of faulty means. But we learn as we go, um, as as we evolve, we learn, oh, that didn't, that didn't address that longing. Yeah. I didn't mean to derail you, but that's No, you just, didn't derail me. Yeah. I've been off the rails so long, I wouldn't even know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have no rails. That's, that's great to know. No, I think that all beings in the universe seek enlightenment, whether they know it or not. Most people don't know it, uh, but it's all, all st streams and rivers flow to the ocean, you know? Mm -hmm. And some streams and rivers may be quite far from the ocean. They've got a ways to go, and, but, uh, you know, others are very close to it. Um, I, you know, it's like I think there's an innate desire for evolution, which might we might interpret as expansion of happiness, if we want to think of it that way, that drives the whole cosmos, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think when we start talking in terms of enlightenment, then we're just making it more explicit. You know, we're, we're kind of getting a clear understanding of what the, what the end game might, might look like. Sure. If we're able to articulate that, then we've already burnt all the bridges that said, maybe I could have happiness through objects. Yeah. Maybe it's the new car. Maybe it's the new wife. Maybe it's, yeah. Yeah. Which is not to say you don't need the objects. We might have to buy a new car pretty soon. Ours is like almost 20 years old or something. Uh, will, it, will it bring enlightenment? No, but it'll get us around <laughs> and not break down and, you know, and have all kinds of repair bills and stuff. A question came in from Michael in Dublin. Let's ask about that. Okay, so this is a good one since we're joking around a lot. He says, um, I am curious about the nature of humor as a path to the divine. As a practitioner of mindful, mindful dreaming, having had several, oh, mindful dreaming? Have, and there's a comment in there. Having had several mindful lucid dreams in which I, have, I wake up in knots laughing. I've done that too. I'm curious to know Cavalier's opinion on how humor, laughter, can bring one closer to the realization. Hmm. Well, I can say that increased laughter in my life is a byproduct of um, a, a type of letting go that was very much held in place when I described that period of practice. Not that this doesn't creep in from time to time, but, but specifically that time where my predominant experience was I'm the practitioner. Um, I'm, I'm really, uh, at the Zen monastery, there was a, a phrase, maybe this is a broad Zen phrase of um, practicing like your hair is on fire. Mm -hmm. And and I really, um, I really embodied that at the time. And there was very little humor mm -hmm. in that, you know, it, whether I had had a good meditation or a bad meditation was um, up for debate according to my conditioned mind. And um, and I always came out, of course, the loser in that scenario. Um, the, the you know the judge was the 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 pseudo Zen master was quite severe, and I just noticed the byproduct of that approach is that I didn't laugh a lot. Hmm. And it seems hard, and it seems hard to even picture that now. I have um, such an experience that um, that laughter and and joy. Uh, express at laughter just being an expression of joy yeah um, that it that it's a natural byproduct of not having to live under the tyranny of that pseudo Zen master yeah and shouldn't joy be uh, considered a legitimate characteristic of enlightenment I mean you, you see that laughing Buddha with his hands up in the air <laughs> like this you know um, and you know they they speak of Ananda, Satchidananda, as you know, mm -hmm. bliss being one of the essential characteristics of consciousness. And you know we can think of many examples of people who seem to be highly evolved or enlightened who were just full of joy and and uh, you know not real serious and and um, ponderous, but just bubbling mm -hmm. bliss. You know. Yes, and I think it's so important that we don't exchange that as a state that we should then seek. 
you know, it's so tempting to say, oh, I'll have reached a certain place if I feel a certain way. And we forget in that that um, that we forget the consciousness only model. We forget that consciousness is just as beautifully, fully in every aspect of our experience of depression as as our experience of laughter. Yeah, that's where I start to wonder, though. I, I might take exception with you on that one. Um, I mean, you hear people saying, well, you can be enlightened and yet be depressed and be angry a lot and be a drinker and, and all these things. Uh, my reaction to that is usually that you're, you're still a work in progress. And, you know, that those kinds of darker behave, feelings and behaviors really are not going to characterize the life of a, a truly enlightened person. And, you know, you said earlier about enlightenment not being an exotic thing. I think the I think you're right. I mean, it's not exotic. It's totally natural. But that is not to dumb it down and just say it's a ho hum ordinary thing. I mean, if if any one of us could step from where we are right now into the sandals of Ramana Maharshi and actually perceive the world as Ramana did, I think we'd notice a pretty significant contrast. We'd say, "Whoa, you know, this is really, really something." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear you, and I'm wondering, um, it's interesting, I think, just to consider where um, the, the spiritual master that we idealize, that we would say, oh, this person doesn't uh, experience depression anymore. I think it's easy to idealize that vision and hold ourselves to the same standard without recognizing that if we hold that as a standard, that's not the path to achieve the place where de depression no longer haunts us. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I'm not implying that, um, uh, I mean, I have a picture of Alma behind me here. And if you ever go to see her and you watch her for a while, sit there for hours watching her do her thing, she goes through all kinds of emotions. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes tears, sometimes laughter, sometimes anger, sometimes this, sometimes that. Uh, and it's this beautiful display that takes place. But I would be surprised if someone like her or like Ramana or like Papaji were suffering from chronic depression or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, surely, because chronic depression is um, a distortion of truth and the reason that we admire these people so much is that they're not their direct experience is in alignment with reality but what i want to point to is it it is it is dangerous to to idealize that state because then I'm focused, I as the seeker can be focused on, I haven't reached that state until I get rid of these things. And again, I speak from my own experience of that pseudo Zen master. Rather, it's, it's my experience that depression doesn't weigh on my life any longer and it did at one point, mm -hmm. that's, that's the natural byproduct of living the recognition of who we actually are. So if even a moment of frustration arises, to be able to recognize that that, that is not a separate experience that I actually need to transcend is what leads a person to reside more fully in truth. Yeah, that's good and well said. And uh, do you feel that there's sort of a depth to your experience such that, um, you know, using an ocean analogy, that, that, you know, there can be waves of all kinds of human experiences and emotions and whatnot, uh, but, you know, your awareness is not just limited to the waves. So there's a sort of a deeper silence to the ocean that you reside in as well all the time, as in addition to the, the constant changing play of the waves. Well, I think what's possible for us through practice is to recognize that we're all of it, but yeah. to not be confused that we're any one aspect of it. The moment I think 
I am this depression is the moment the distortion has been glorified. Yeah, that's the thing. I think the term overshadowment is useful here. And maybe we could use a sun analogy where the clouds overshadow the sun and it no longer seems to be shining, even though it is still shining um, from its own perspective. And I think one can rise to a state of realization in which one is the sun and one knows one is shining all the time and clouds come and go. But, you know, obviously people get very overshadowed by things. And um, I just watched the video today of a woman getting a tr pulled over by a cop for speeding and she completely freaked out. Now, you and I probably wouldn't do that. We'd take it in stride and talk to the policeman, take our ticket if we deserved a ticket. But this woman had a conniption fit for half an hour. I didn't watch the whole half hour. <laughs> so, and I thought, man, this, this, this woman could use a little meditation or something. She's so overshadowed. Yeah, and that's why I have this love for tools because for a person that's going to lose such full sight of what we're talking about is the truth of who we actually are, the sun, the lose, lose that much sight of the sun, it can be so beneficial to be able to pause in that moment and, for example, recognize what my negative self-talk is, just to be able to start with something that simple. You know, one of the first things we teach the teens we work with mm -hmm. is that they are not their thoughts, and it's so significant for them to, you can just watch these light bulbs go off because there's that moment of, of being able to see, oh, the reason I'm freaking out right now is because I'm listening to this narrative of negative self-talk, which leads to, what's the Buddha quote about thoughts leading to deeds, leading to actions, leading mm. to, you know, it's that, it's that whole sequence. But I think it's important just to, to go back to that point, because it, I think it's a, a, an, um, an important one. I think it's important to, to name that the, that the cloud is just as, as valid a part of the landscape is everything else. Because again, just because of where we're going with this conversation, the temptation for the spiritual practitioner can be, now I have to get rid of those clouds so that I can see the sun more fully, forgetting what you pointed out, that we are the sun. Yeah, right. And I guess the question is, you know, what is the most effective way of getting rid of the clouds, or what is the most effective way of realizing that we are the sun? We're stretching this metaphor a bit here. Is it to obsess about the clouds and try to push them away or something? Or is it to somehow, you know, just move toward the sun and, and grab it, you know? I mean, yeah. we can maybe reference meditation here. One could sit and struggle with one's thoughts and kind of conduct some kind of inner battle. Uh, but is that really going to allow one to settle into the state of you know, Turiya or, or yeah. realization of pure awareness. I, th I think there's a more effective way. Yeah, and one of the things that interests me is um, having come from a monastic tradition where the only focus was on those clouds. How do they form? Where in the where in the landscape are they arising? What are they made of? How do they feel as those clouds roll in? All of this sort of present moment examination, not from a heady way, but a very experiential um, uh, awareness of what it, and where I trained, we, we talked about the conditioned patterns that govern us, the karmic and condition um, patterns that govern us, meaning the who we are when we're perceiving ourselves as separate from life. The thing that I appreciate so much, and this takes us back to where we were before about the direct path, is the the way in that approach, there's so much language given to the nature of the sun. It, it, you know, it, there's something valid about saying, all those clouds are just clouds. Now let's really unpack what is the nature of the sun? Mm. It's good. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you too have found both those um, approaches to be enriching in your own life and practice. Yeah. Also, I don't want to go into it in great detail, but the nature of the, the kind of meditation I learned was such that it utilized what was called the natural tendency of the mind 
to seek a field of greater happiness, and which we were talking about earlier, actually. And the, you know, the idea being that pure consciousness or pure awareness is innately blissful, and that if we move in that direction, the mind will encounter greater charm or greater happiness. So the, a, a condition was set up in the practice where the mind would begin to just effortlessly move in that direction, and as it did so, it would encounter greater and greater happiness, and therefore it was just like drop, falling off a diving board or something. It was just effortless transcending, uh, and no need to, to muck around in, in the clouds <laughs> or, or, worry, yeah. or worry much about you know, whether there were thoughts or this or that. If there were, you just come back to the practice and take another dive. Um, yeah, anyway. Because we're, because we're always being called back to ourselves. Yeah. But we do have to we do have to be open to hearing that call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the senses have a natural tendency to draw the attention outward. That's what they're designed to do, and mm -hmm. and so you know a good practice will set up a condition where, as the Gita says, the senses withdraw from their objects like a tortoise withdraws its legs into its mm -hmm. shell. It sort of turns them around 180 degrees and just come back to the self. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Rupert uses that phrase, allowing the attention to sink into the source of awareness rather than, I mean, just think about how often our attention is habituated to be moving outward, even yeah. outward to the object of the breath, mm -hmm. for example, in traditional Zen meditation. That's good. Yeah, I like that phrase Rupert used. Mm -hmm. Rupert is so soothing. Whenever I'm at the Sam conference, <laughs> I'm usually a little tired because there's so much going on, and I sit in, mm -hmm. in Rupert's thing and I fall asleep because he's so <laughs> soothing. <laughs> you just rest. Yeah, his well, voice. Well, and he's and also his... got he's also got that British uh, British thing to to his benefit. We have a uh, a guy who works on our team named Barnaby, who's he's got this British accent, and um, I mean, he's definitely our most popular uh, meditation teacher voice. If yeah. if if people are putting in a vote for who reads a meditation or leads a meditation, it's going to be Barnaby. They want Barnaby, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the reason the Beatles became so popular, aside from the fact their music was so great, everybody loved the accents. Um, in your notes, you say, here's another point we're going to bring up, how ethics, right action fit in. Having a moral compass, the compass that naturally arises when we recognize ourselves as awareness, indivisible. What would you like to say about that? I think um, when I was considering our conversation, I was just recognizing it might be a rich place to to explore this this notion that um, it's actually along the lines of what we've been talking about. For example, the precepts, the way that the precepts were so useful to me when I first became a monk because I found them, it was like something I could could lean into. you know here here's this um, spiritual code of conduct that will that will hold me. Um, but the more that I've, um, the the more that I've practiced, the more recognition there is that when we're when we're resting in the awareness of who we authentically are, when we're recognizing and knowing ourselves as as consciousness itself, a natural byproduct of that experience is is to do no harm. And I think that the the danger of uh, a morality being blended with um, the, the, the maybe the early stages of practice approach can be for a personality type like mine, it's easy to reinforce the idea of right and wrong rather than support the moving beyond the concept of duality. Hmm. Well, what you just said there was very nice, that if we're resting in our true nature, you know, then it's what we're naturally disinclined to do harm. But having said that, what do you make of all the teachers and gurus and spiritual leaders and whatnot that have done harmful things? It seems to be a syndrome. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, my, my take on it is that when I look at my own experience, I see the places, as you talk about a work in prog um, progress, I have the same experience that no matter uh, no matter how many different ways the lights come on 
practice will be part of my life for the rest of my life, not from that seeking place, but from the non-practice practice. I think place. the Buddha practiced all his life even. Absolutely. Yeah. Because because all of life to me appears to be at this point in time a constant refinement of how to have our actions in the world be in service of our greatest understanding and how to have um, complete attunement um, in in that way. And there are all sorts of subtle ways, even maybe just in thought form, that that might not always be the case. And to me, it's just very engaging to be able to be present to that and to notice that. Um, so I, it seems, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 am I projecting or did you have a little something you wanted to say about that real quick? Oh, I always have things I want to say, but I'm letting please. you go on as long no, as you please. want. <laughs> no, 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 say and then we'll, and then we'll, well, I like the word refinement that you just used. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a, a tremendous range of possibilities in terms of refinement, um, mm -hmm. even after self-realization. Uh, refinement of the senses, of behavior, of the heart, of the intellect, of all kinds of different facets of the personality. There can be tremendous po potential for purification and refinement and one can culture the aptitude to function from an extremely refined level, which is not to say one is going to be sort of ultra-sensitive and incapable of functioning in the world, it's that one can integrate that development such that one can be extremely refined while functioning in the world. Absolutely. Beautifully, beautifully said. Very well articulated and, and, and is reflective of my own experience that 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 and, and to me there's a real joy in that refinement. Like a um, like I just had this image of a guy who like collects Mustangs and he, nothing brings him more pleasure than going out and polishing up his Mustangs and getting like little added parts. That's, maybe I should make this a girl, by the way. So we're, we're going to make it a sort of a guy that has his Mustangs. This is going to be a woman, but she has her Mustangs and she she goes out and, you know, she's she's constantly tinkering with them just out of the love of this beautiful car and mm -hmm. I, I feel the same way about wanting to bring as much love, compassion, consciousness to where the ego hides in the body. You know, there's that old Zen story about the, the Zen master who's on her deathbed and someone says, um, someone says something like, Do you have any parting words for us before you, before you pass? And how are how are you doing? And I believe that uh, she says something to the effect of, well, my mind is ready, uh, but my body has some catching up to do. Mm -hmm. um, so where is the, you know, where is this sense of separateness lodging in, in the body? Perhaps we've brought a lot of attention to those conditioned patterns of the mind and to being able to re release and let go, recognize ourselves as the sun. But the, where, where, what's hiding out? on other realms, what's happening energetically. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just have to interject that uh, I interviewed a man named John Sampson a few months ago who was in his 90s when I interviewed him who, I know he designed the Ford Thunderbird and I think he had a lot to do with the, 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 the Mustang also. Really? Uh, yeah, and then he ended up having a spiritual awakening and we had a whole talk, mm -hmm. but I uh, just had to throw that in. I'll, <laughs> have, to, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, as you were speaking, the word the word neuroplasticity came to mind. I'm sure most people have heard of that, which is that you know, and I've also heard the term brain sculpting, um, and it's well known now and becoming better and better understood that you know regular spiritual practice actually physically changes the brain in ways that show up quite dramatically on fMRI scans and things like that, and that kind of thing doesn't happen in a snap. You know, it takes a long time to culture. <clears throat> and I, I think that, and I've also been listening to more lately to Joan Harrigan, who uh, runs, runs the Patanjali Kundalini Yoga Care thing down in Tennessee. I've interviewed her. And she has a really sophisticated understanding of all the subtle mechanics of the physiology and the Kundalini and all the channels that it can flow through and how it can become deflected or stuck or, you know, this, it, it really helps to make sense of a lot of the experiences we hear about with people experience, experiencing all kinds of things or teachers behaving badly, for instance, who seem to have so much charisma and, and uh, shakti and, and even siddhis and yet are really screwed up in certain ways. Um, yeah. So all that stuff needs, I think, to be understood more commonly.
Yes, because I realized I didn't fully come back to what about these gurus that yeah. are conducting this behavior. Well, in my experience, one of the reasons we're, we're working with this uh, refinement is because uh, when it's when a person says, oh, the lights came on, I recognize my true nature, therefore I'm done, <laughs> that dangerous things begin to happen. Yeah. Someone might perceive that they can't spread AIDS because they're an enlightened person, which is sort of a horrifying thought. But it's happened. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, it feels to me that uh, There was this... even a spiritual, I'm sorry to interrupt, there's even no, a spiritual please. teacher whose interview I had to take down, I had interviewed him, who was pressing, uh, many years ago when he was already functioning as a spiritual teacher, was, was training young girls, underage girls, to work as strippers, telling them that the body is an illusion, and it doesn't matter what you do with it, and the world is an illusion, and things like that. You know, so what a crazy thing. It's an incredibly crazy thing, and and that is one of those dangers of, of you know you and I pointed to the danger of saying well I you know we're all enlightened and therefore you know anything goes without real discernment yeah uh, around the nature of what is the recognition of what is the ego what's on behalf of an illusion of a separate self and what what is a manifestation of of the heart or truth. Yeah. Key word, discernment. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, we were talking about zeal before. I, I, I would say if there's one quality that would be the most valuable tool in your spiritual toolbox, it's discernment. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important because, you know, without discernment, it, it seems that it's very hard to have an experience of clarity because my my the hologram that I'm inside of whatever my story is feels as real to me as anything else. And it requires discernment to be able to say, I know this feels real. And can I can I come back to the recognition of myself as awareness? Can I can I experience in this moment the way in which perhaps this this story uh, can't be trusted the way that I'm conditioned to trust it? I mean, when we look at our culture's addiction to the um, to the matter model, you know what we what we see is um, a lack of discernment around how that matter model is being perpetuated um, and maintained and, and adhered to across the board. Yeah. There's a book by Shankara called The Crest Jewel of Discrimination. I think it's called Vivika Chudamani. And uh, discrimination, I think, is closely related to discernment. But um, I think what he's implying with that title and goes on to elaborate in the book is just being able to sort of have this sort of scalpel-like intellect or discernment uh, 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 in terms of subtle distinctions and gradations because as a, you know the, that Somerset Mom, The Razor's Edge, which was actually based upon his visit with Ramana Maharshi, that book, um, there, as the path progresses I think the, the need for discernment becomes more acute um, mm -hmm. You know, go ahead and respond to that. Absolutely, and I find that it become for me it's become even more acute um, through teaching. You know, to be able, I've had plenty of unskillful moments where after an interaction, I'm able to see, I you know, uh, I can discern that there might have been a more skillful way to have supported a person that I'm in this or the person that I was in that interaction with. Um, and and again, what sh what interests me is what shifts when we love that process of of refinement um, because it's no longer uh, we keep looping back around. It's interesting to me, but we, d because it's no longer coming from I need to polish this this stone so that it'll be as shiny as possible, and I'm not enlightened until it's fully shiny. I mean, I I, I really appreciate um, uh, the way that Rupert talks about enlightenment is like chapter three, you know, and, and that recognizing our true nature is chapter three. And there's a lot 
beyond that. Mm. Um, and and when when the beyond that isn't coming from the energy of filling a hole that will never be filled because it's it's the, it's the seekings on behalf of this separate self, when the energy is coming from the love of the refinement process, when it's coming from wanting to be the most clear, open channel for consciousness and to be an agent of love in the world, it has a very different energetic quality. Yeah, I think we're kind of getting at it, but it would be interesting maybe for you and I to the extent we're able. I'd also like to hear Rupert talk about what all those other chapters might be. It'd be, it'd be kind of cool to, to have a kind of table of contents of the whole book, you know, if Enlightenment is chapter three and there happen to be 15 chapters. <laughs> yeah, well, he might, you know, he's so uh, beautifully articulate with words and, and maps and creating maps. He might have some very specific um, chapters there. For me, I would say it's just an ongoing refinement. And as we talked about, that means addressing the energy. It means addressing the energy body. It means addressing the physical body. It means addressing um, the mind. It means um, uh, using everything in our experience to see how suffering is created in order to drop that and yeah. and end suffering through through recognizing who we actually are. It means letting, it's just chapter after chapter of nuanced experiences of letting our expression of our greatest understanding in the world manifest in, in the most um, authentic and pure way possible. And we see that, to go back to your mention of Amma, we see that in the way that Amma embraces everyone equally. It's astounding to watch, isn't it? It is. I mean, everyone that comes to her is embraced equally. And that was a huge, uh, huge, beautiful, uh, open heart experience for me in watching her as you did for um, a period of time, just seeing that the embodiment of all is welcome because I am that. I recognize myself as that, which doesn't turn anything or anyone away, which cannot be disturbed, which was never born, which will never die. Yeah, it's kind of an amazing experience. She's in the States. I don't know if she's here yet, but she will be soon. Ama.org, if anybody wants to check her out. She goes all over the country. Um, but you know, your jaw drops after a while when you see what she does. Mm -hmm. and for 14, 18 hours at a stretch without getting off the couch. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you might get a little chuckle out of the fact that, you know, so I come from this um, Zen monastic uh, lineage where there's a lot of, uh, I mean, we didn't even have couches on the property, you know, there's just, you know, you've, you've got the image of the, the kind of traditional Zen um, setting for training. And then the man that I ended up marrying had spent years in ashrams through um, Amma's lineage huh. and has been a devotee since he was 26. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those two worlds to collide yeah, has, been, <laughs> has been quite quite interesting and quite beautiful, quite enriching for both of us. Yeah, nice. So. Mm -hmm. um, here's a nice point. I, I want to, before we're done, and we, we're not about to be done anytime too soon, uh, I do want to talk about what you're doing in the schools. And, and there's a website people can go to watch some videos of, what, of your program in, in the Portland School and you know, kids talking about what their experience is of, of the program. And also, I think maybe what I'll also do is put a link to your talk at the SAND conference on your page. I love that. Yeah, on your page on BatGap, because I just listened to it again the other day, and it was such a great talk, um, you know, with not only the talk, but then little clips from, you know, kids talking mm -hmm. uh, about their experience. It's really remarkable what you're doing. So, well, since I've introduced it like that, well, let's talk about it now. What, what would you like to tell us about that? That for me, that work is just the current expression of, of love that feels the most engaging regarding the reward of watching uh, lights come on. Mm. And 
you know, I just this morning we got another um, edited video of a student of mine, Nanong, who go, his real name is Christopher. He goes by Nanong. Um, and uh, it's just two minutes of him talking about no longer having to walk through the world with his smile as a mask but the experience of being able to release that and move through the world more confidently standing in who he actually is. Mm. And it just, I mean, I, I dare someone to watch it and not get moved. It's so, it's so touching. Um, and as you heard me say in that talk, you know, these teens are not uh, as crusty as adults. You know, they don't have the same, you know, you and I were talking about the clouds. They don't have 80 clouds on top of each other, um, generally speaking, there's a, the, the veil is so much thinner um, between who they see themselves to be and who they authentically are. And that's, it's incredibly rewarding and rich and beautiful to, to, to watch teens experience that. And, and one of the reasons that I, I'm so excited about how it's blossomed um, here in Portland is because I, I, I don't know of any other program that, that goes beyond just teaching a teen how to direct the attention to the present moment without judgment. Not that that's not a beautiful thing to teach teens. It is, it's incredibly wonderful that mindfulness at large is spreading um, around the world and with young people. And I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a really important um, and beautiful thing that's happening and I, I feel so deeply honored to be part of a program that because it's a semester long experience, we're, we're witnessing real transformation. And, and I think, as you said about the brain, you know, it might interest you to know, um, and you actually probably already know that that's the most plastic window that there is that, you know, the, the brain's plasticity and, uh, you know, when we're teens, I mean, we used to think, um, you probably know this, we used to think that once you hit 25, the brain's not plastic at all right. anymore. And of course, now we know that's not actually the case, but it does seem to still be the case, uh, according to science, that that, that window, um, there's just, it's just so plastic. And, and I definitely see that in my experience. And it's, it's just very touching to, um, to be able to have to, to have an insight about an exercise I might do, bring it into uh, work with some teens to watch this sort of opening and full embrace and and real recognition of of uh, a sense of of self, um, an authentic sense of self. Um, versus just the illusion of all the identities that were um, trained to, indoctrinated to create and maintain. Um, it's incredible to watch that and then do the same exercise with a group of adults and sort of sometimes be met with this, well, I don't know, I mean, uh, this kind of, you know, um, squirrely resistance, which is fine. You know, we, we, we sometimes, that's an important part of practice to, to, to resist what is so close to home. We're not ready to take it in yet, but it's pretty inspiring. It really is. And it's really saving lives literally and enriching lives. And, you know, kids are doing better academically as a result of it. And uh, just, you know, I mean, high school is such a crazy time. Sometimes I think, I wouldn't mind being reincarnated again, you know, I mean, you know, serve the world and all that. But then I think, oh, but I'd have to go through high school. <laughs> but then I think, okay. I think I, most yeah. people say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I dropped out of high school. Um, Did you? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I picked up things afterwards, you know, once I, yeah, learned, yeah. Once I learned to meditate, I kind of got it together. But um, it was such a difficult time, you know, and, and it is for most kids. It's it's. It's really intense, and so you know it's such a valuable thing. Do you, do you get any opposition to it, um, you know, from fundamentalist Christians or from anybody else who thinks that you shouldn't be doing it in there? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it's always important for me to clarify that while teens through this course are getting this, um, knowing, learning how to get in touch with their experience of who they are. I've, we've done a really good job paying a lot of attention to how we bring that about. This is the sort of, the, the, we talk about the tailoring and the compassionate concessions. And, and because we put so much focus on how this course um, uh, takes place, it's, 
equally accessible to a Christian, to an atheist. My Muslim students get as much out of the class as my students whose parents are Buddhist. And so for that reason, because of what the teens experience in terms of personal transformation and sort of collective transformation in the classroom, we've only had folks come to us and say, thank you so much that I can, you know, that my my teen is now part of this community and able to recognize, um, uh, you know, people will use different language for it. Some people might just, who have no background at all with any kind of meditation might say, all I know is Johnny's confident now. Yeah. You know, he's not walking around afraid all the time. Mm-hmm. So it is important to acknowledge that as I mentioned before, when I was talking about, um, you know, I do a lot of work with adults as well. And and in in working with a teen or adult, there's so many moments where it's not actually useful, helpful or appropriate to just say, oh, OK, you are awareness. Now let's start the conversation from there. But to direct a person to experience what's most primary about their existence, you know, our own being, that is that is not something that when it's when it's skillfully shared, that's not in contradiction to any Christian faith. It's not in contradiction to um, it's actually not in contradiction to anything because it is the recognition that we are everything. Yeah. Do you find that the in addition to the, the personal transformation and um, d- development of confidence and diminishment of confusion and things like that the kids experience that there's a big blossoming in terms of their um, respect and appreciation and kindness toward one another it's monumental yeah. I, I really didn't know when this program started that I would be able to witness in a sense what we would hope to see in the world, but in a classroom. So one of the ways that happens is that, you know, for for Susie Q, who's always felt, maybe Susie Q is the popular teenager and maybe Johnny's the class nerd, but for, for Johnny to see that Susie Q has the same self-talk that he does, it's so bonding in an authentic bonding way. Think of how unhealthy ways that we bond with each other as adults and ways that we bond with each other as teens might be. You know, we might bond over, let's do drugs together, or we might bond over, like, let's bully this guy together. Yeah. But we, but we, we don't, we're not, we're often in this conditioned society, we're often not taught on how bonding could be a reflection of our inherent interconnection. It could just be an outpouring, a recognition of what's inherently so and that's what happens in the class um it the class arises out of this context of the con uh, uh, an environment of care and confidentiality acceptance reverence and empathy and that that tender environment of care really is um conscious community and that's so inspiring to me because it's one thing for a teen to go to like therapy and maybe get some new understanding of his condition survival strategies and coping mechanisms because we do we go over those kinds of things in this class like how are you how are you conditioned to survive the stress of being a teenager um but uh yeah it's really it's really the the community that allows the flourishing of the teachings that's great I keep thinking about my high school experience as you were as you were talking, and you know we were just kind of I at least was really kind of a lost little guy and in my own little bubble and you know had my little group of friends, usually the more nerdy ones uh, <laughs> but um yeah, just kind of like walking around in a daze you know and and there wasn't at least from my perspective there wasn't this sort of openness and bonding and inter clique communication and, and empathy and, and any of the kind of stuff that you're alluding to and um, yeah, that made it all the more difficult and I remember myself picking on, on kids that were you know different than me in some way and, and you know, I, I regret that to this day I still feel guilty about stuff that I did f- over 50 years ago so I don't know yeah. I, just, I just think it's so wonderful what you're doing well 
Thank you. And and I relate to, you know, we can regret these things later because it hurts the heart. Yeah. We we know we know that those behaviors, we know deep down, and especially young people know it. Like as adults, we get so hardened that we might know it, but we might not actually feel the impact of it in the same way anymore. But these teens really feel it, you know, something happens and they see like, oh, that's that just you know, I, there's just, again, it's like less, less layers of crust. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's incredible. It's like, I feel as though all our program actually does is offer ways for teens to be the expression of who they actually are. Whereas everything else in high school, that, that's a little dramatic, not everything else in high school, but a lot of other influences are saying who you should be and what you need and what you don't have enough of and how to form your identity and what you need to be um, planning for your future and what you need to be afraid of. And then we wonder why we're not happy later because, you know, we're under the thumb of all of this conditioning. The most uh, high school suicides last time I checked that I was at least privy to hearing about were all in... um, areas where there's like high pressure to get into really good schools and like these, you know, I know one area is like the the Palo Alto area where there was just these, this sort of cluster suicide epidemic from teens not being able to um, function under the pressure created all of the conditioned pressure, all of those clouds. Yeah. If anyone hasn't seen the movie Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams, they should watch that movie. Mm. Mm. That's an oldie and goodie, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, this, uh, in a way, this kind of segue, and, and as a reminder, I'm going to link to Caverly's presentation at the Sand Conference because, uh, you know, she explains the program very nicely and talks about how it developed, but she also has some nice clips in there of the kids talking about the impact it's had on them. Um, is there any kind of a... I know it's grown quite a bit in Portland. I mean, is there any sort of indication that it might branch out even further? And, you know, other states and you know, do you get in touch? Yeah. Do people get in touch with you from Ohio and places like that? Every day, uh. every day, we get an email from somebody else because there is. We have a woman doing a dissertation project in the fall on the program from Johns Johns Hopkins, and you know, as we put structures in place to um, show the efficacy of what we're doing. I mean, we we know the efficacy of what we're doing, and we've never actually had a principal or administrator in in Portland ask for outside research because they just see what's happening. But as we put things in place so that other people um, can um, can can see on paper from afar yeah. what what the effects are, um, we're, we're getting um, we're getting, in a sense, overwhelmed by the demand and what that it's a good problem to yeah, have, yeah. because what it shows me is that there is actually a thirst for a program like this to be um, I don't know. Rupert said it's going to be worldwide in five years. And I said, oh, my gosh, don't <laughs> don't, don't say that. Um, and, and the reason I joke about don't say that is we have decided just recently that we we want to have Portland be a showroom of sorts before we go beyond Portland. So there are a lot of nuances to doing what we do. And so we were in seven Portland public high schools now with this semester long credited course. And then in the fall, we'll be in 10. And then very soon we'll be district wide in Portland. Mm -hmm. Once we can build this, um, build out this whole school model that we're forming. And most importantly, once we can build the next level of our adult training program so that we can have more people teaching this very intensive and deep curriculum, uh, then I think we will be ready to bring this outside Portland, which I'm very excited about. That's great. Um, Yeah, the way I see it happening is that each city could have a different hub point person that will hold the vision, um, hold the integrity of the depth of this curriculum, and then that person can, um, you know, train more teachers and and have it expand that way. Um, and and I already have some some uh, cities with those people lined up and ready, saying, you know, just let us know when you're you're happy with the showroom um, in Portland, because we we really we're we're a program that's focusing on scaling in depth versus just 
we need to scale in breadth because obviously there's the need and there's the push and there's demand to scale in breadth. But I, I just really don't want to water down the the integrity of, of what we've created by yeah. going too fast. I was just thinking that it could easily become diluted or distorted or can, you know perverted or something in some way, you know, yeah, you really have to have some kind of quality control as it grows. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that's, yeah, that's just really important to us. But yeah, who knows, maybe someone's watching that would love to see it, um, see us build out that infrastructure, you know, so that, so that it can expand more fully. And, and I appreciate you bringing attention to peace in schools, because it does let me get to say, we're always looking for folks to, to support that vision. Yeah. A good friend of mine is the CEO of the David Lynch Foundation, which is doing something of some, somewhat similar with TM in, in schools, especially inner cities and things like that. Also, yeah. also PTSD. I mean, there's a lot of other applications for what you're doing, like P, you know, veterans with PTSD and uh, homeless people, and there's all kinds of things where you could apply the same principle, I suppose. Totally, and just offer up all these tools. I mean, our our curriculum is very dense with tools. Yeah. Um, so teens learn how to, you know, recognize the conditioned mind and, and learn how to to um, have the discernment to know whether they're uh, they're identified with the conditioned mind or whether they're um, coming from a place that in that curriculum we talk about as center. Um, in a way, it's all the things and that 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 course, that semester long course has all of the tools that I find that the average adult I work with could benefit from having in the tool belt in order to feel, uh, practice, um, be able to flourish. Yeah. It seems to me that, I mean, growing on the, building on the thought I just mentioned, um, with certain modifications, you could take this and, and, pres and insert it into all kinds of situations, like again, the opio opioid epidemic, you know, which is huge. Um, I mean, and w a lot of its authorities are desperate to find a solution to that. H here again, the, the, this could be extremely valuable. I, I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. and I, I have a type of uh, excitement around just watching what will organically unfold because I'm so clear that I've been a midwife for this, yeah. but that it's, it's, you know, it's, even though I, I would be lying if I hadn't said I've worked really hard, it's so clear that it's not, um, that the, that the project isn't due to my hard work. There's mm -hmm. something that has organically evolved that, uh, now it's just a train. I try to, I try to stay on because it moves quickly and, and we have a team of people that, um, that are just extremely dedicated. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I, I get that to a certain extent with BatGap too, where you, you have this feeling like you're, what you're doing has an impact and therefore yeah. whatever the intelligence governing the universe is, um, kind of like gets behind you and, and, you know, gives you support. Absolutely. I think for us, the same thing's been happening around Presence Collective, which is the Presence Collective is a DBA of Peace in Schools. And I'm doing, you know, the teaching, leading meditation retreats and workshops through the book that I put out will be through Presence Collective. And there's just this momentum of um, the community and then what's beyond the community that seems to um, have a life of its own for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shifting topics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Another nice little note you wrote here, which I would like to talk about, is exploring the foundation of world peace. And I think that actually we can segue mm -hmm. into this pretty well from what we were just saying. The greatest gift we can give is to wake up to our true nature. It has to begin there. True justice and world peace can only come through starting with the recognition of what we all share. It can only come through the realization that our very being is, in fact, shared. And... Um, and I always kind of remember the analogy of if a forest is to be green, then all the trees have to be green. Each individual mm. tree has to know its true nature. That is, it has to be sort of in touch with its ground and, and, and derive nourishment from there in order to flourish as an individual tree. And then the forest will be green. But, you mm. know, to, to neglect the nourishment of each individual tree and try to impose greenness on the forest you know, by mm. spray painting it or something isn't going to work. Absolutely. I love that. I love that analogy. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it really 
points to the importance of uh, nourishment. So what if instead of uh, seeking enlightenment, we nourished our recognition of what's most directly our experience of existence? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that is certainly not uh, incompatible with seeking enlightenment. I mean, I mean that's by by one definition what seeking enlightenment is. Yes, I was just referring to the earlier part of the conversation from that that seeking from the place where that that uh, assumes some sort of separation. Right, right. Which, in fact, even though that process is required on some level or certainly often seems to be the case. Um, there are people who just seem to have these spontaneous uh, experiences, but for most uh, for most of us that that seems to be required. But even in that case where where it seems to be required, uh, folks always say the same thing. you know I, I turned around and realized that there there there, there was no separate, self that achieved anything through that that striving i mean in a way isn't a, enlightenment just the greatest disappointment for the ego it's uh, it's uh, you know it's the ultimate letdown it's the ultimate letdown that uh, you know i've 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 worked so hard and yet this isn't an experience that is mine to have it can't it can't have it no i can't have it i mean it's like saying the the drop wants to have the ocean. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Drop and just I, has to sort of relax into knowing that it is the ocean. A hundred percent. Yeah. And there's re and there really isn't any loss because I mean, let's say you you go from your your garden into your house, and obviously you, you sort of leave the garden, but then you you're enjoying the house. Or to use another example, you you live in a hut. And there's this beautiful palace, and and you you go to the palace, but you don't regret the loss of the of the hut when you're when you've moved into the palace. <laughs> Just yeah. throwing metaphors out. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm well, no, I'm I'm hanging with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now here's another nice thing that plays upon the world peace point that we made. Um, you say, practice is the deepest contribution that it is possible to make to society. I read some quote from Ramana along those lines recently. Eradicating poverty would be a natural byproduct of waking up, for example. I think that all the problems in the world are a symptom, or are symptoms of the fact that people haven't woken up by and large, and that if there were a mass awakening, which hopefully is in its fledgling stages and will happen, that all these problems will just sort of dissipate as, you know, like as those trees of the forest d begin to suck up the nourishment from their ground. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, would you say that that's your experience when you look around? It's my experience in my own life. Um, yeah. And, you know, if we extrapolate from our individual lives to the world, which is not that far-fetched to do, then yeah. I, I really think that, um, you know, I think that everyone has their basis in an inexhaustible reservoir of potential, whether they know it or not. <coughs> and if yeah. they can somehow know it, then that potential will begin to be channeled through them, and yeah. they'll become more successful, more productive, more creative. You know, all the and all the problems that that are created by virtue of the fact that people are deficient in those things mm -hmm. will um, will just fade away. I mean, and even on the level of, you know, cool new technologies being discovered, you know, that could, you know, get all the extra carbon out of the air or better mm -hmm. solar panels or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, alternative energy and all kinds of stuff. Um, th there's no end to possibilities. It's just a matter. We don't have a, an energy shortage. We have an intelligence shortage. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean intellectual intelligence. I mean sort of attunement to the divine intelligence. Absolutely. And the more uh, lack of uh, attunement there is, the greater the lack of attunement, uh, the, the more problems yeah. we seem to have because 
as you pointed out, that's what happens personally. The, 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 the less attunement, the more suffering in right in here yeah and and then um you know that's what's happening societally too if if you look at our conditioned world right now it's actually a, a perfectly accurate brushstroke representation of the conditioned mind you know the 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 way what's happening uh on the level of of our conditioned world is is just such an accurate accurate representation yeah well mm -hmm. i mean the conditioned world is the reflection of seven billion conditioned minds yeah you know whatever the, like the, the forest analogy again whatever the mm -hmm. overall appearance of the forest it's due to the condition of all the trees that make it up absolutely <laughs> so let's, yeah. let's change the trees yeah <laughs> yeah they can't they they can't be separated they can't be separated out and I and I I love that one of the themes that we've we've bounced around and kept coming back to in this call is um, it doesn't even require changing the trees. It requires recognizing that which leads to a lack of nourishment. Yeah, nourishing the trees. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean putting in new trees. I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 just, making the better trees or yeah, there's um, kind of a drought you know ending the yeah, drought yeah absolutely allowing allowing the trees to be trees without all of the ways that we interfere with the um, the wondrous nature of what is yeah all of the ways that the conditioned world and the conditioned mind interferes with with the wondrous nature of of what is yeah and this is not a Pollyanna-ish kind of discussion we're having here. I, I really think that something of this nature is in is percolating. You know, it's mm. in it's in the works, and you, what you're doing is an example of it. And um, you know, if, if we all just keep doing it as we feel moved to, and each in our own way, you know, I think it may be an unstoppable, unstoppable force. Yeah. I think that the time is such that, uh, that something of this nature is obviously needed and also is um, it's something which, whose time has come. Yeah, the, the time has come and specifically there's so much thirst and hunger for truth because the distortion is so severe. So I was thinking the other day about how, uh, how when storms are brewing on the horizon and just very, very dramatic storms, we can sometimes forget that those storms can leave um, a deep quenching of the earth and uh, can can be part of this nourishment process because we're we're just so perhaps triggered into seeing the storm and then feeling like we have to batten down the hatches. And, and, and I appreciate your point that this that's not a Pollyanna recognition. It's not to say, oh, everything always turns up good. It's sunny. It's, it's recognizing inherent goodness, yeah. which is not the opposite of bad. <laughs> I heard a great metaphor the other day. Someone was talking about, you know, it may seem that how can you be so optimistic when there's these politicians doing this and these, mm -hmm you know, this corruption here and these corporations there and all that. And the, the metaphor presented was, well, you know, when you make chicken soup, this kind of this scum kind of bubbles to the surface and you can skim, skim it off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As a vegetarian, I've, I'm not quite, uh, I'm not quite uh, saying I can come from experience on that one, but I, I get the idea. I get yeah. the idea. You know, it's, it's the kind of lotus mud thing too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I totally follow it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, dokie. What do you got here in terms of additional points? I want to cover all these points because they're so great. Good. Nice. I, I really appreciate you sending me these. Um, oh, good. Well, since I haven't got that book out yet, I just figured I'd toss out some some things that I've been looking at. And and Rick, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's it's fun that those are engaging things for you too. I appreciate the alchemy of our of our connection. Yeah, a lot of these points are just things that I'm passionate about and mm -hmm. um, that I've thought about for decades. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I think we're we're both onto something here. <laughs> <laughs> we're not alone. That's yeah. for sure. Um, okay, 
So, here's a point I don't think we've quite covered. Um, you're currently interested in the collective conditioning we have. So the collective conditioning is women. The collective conditioning is men. Recognizing the power of collective presence, hence our new name, you have this thing, Presence Collective, in the face of that collective conditioning. I guess we've maybe sort of touched on it, but maybe there's a little bit more we could say about it. Yeah, anything specific arise for you as you as you read that, just to start us off with it? What comes to mind as I read it is that con conditioning can seem very ingrained and intractable and you know hard to change, um, but it can change, and even an individual's conditioning can change dramatically. Um, I just don't think that things, I mean, there are certain things that are, calcified and have been for thousands of years, you know, like certain uh, the Shias and the Sunnis, for instance, have been going at it forever, and, and the Palestinians and, and the Israelis, and the, uh, all, some of these situations just seem so hard to resolve, and they're a deep kind of collective conditioning. So, you know, maybe we could talk about how what you're introducing here and what we're talking about here could actually be an antidote to uh, those long established um, patterns. Yeah, something that's just interesting to me right now is I've spent so much time as a monk bringing attention to the conditioning of this body mind. And as I've said, it's there's so much benefit that's come from, you know, I, I know my Ennea type and not that I know everything about like, what it means to be a one on the Enneagram or, but I know, I know how um, the, I know the shadow sides of my own conditioning and, and how that can uh, create this distortion that I'm, that I'm something other than the sun, for example. So to have that immersion in um, uh, understanding of personal conditioning, something that's interested in me is how does that relate to collective conditioning? And so I'm, I'm lately found it really engaging to look at um, structures of conditioning. So again, just to bring back that, that point that I tossed out at the beginning of our conversation, you know, how has the oppression of minorities, um, uh, how has that collective conditioning um, stayed in place? And how does something like the kind of awareness practice, which is, a, again, a non-practice really at its core, but how does something like that um, address these large system um, uh, institutionalized structures, um, because I believe it's the only thing that can. We've we've proven to ourselves that just, for example, fighting racism um, isn't the answer. It's deeply dualistic. It doesn't take us to uh, uh, another degree of understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just kind of a matter of. I think that the kind of thing you're doing um, and things like it could easily become mainstream. Um, mm -hmm. And so it will, you know, you know, as we've been saying with all of our metaphors of forests and stuff, you, you just can't really, political solutions have never really been long term. Or, and the same patterns keep cropping up again. I mean, there, certainly there have been good, uh, you know, um, advancements. Uh, you know, women's suffrage and, and certain, you know, um, the abolition of slavery and, and the Voting rights, rights Act and all kinds of good things have come along. Um, but I, I tend to see those things as more like reflections of shifts in collective consciousness than as, uh, as causes in themselves. They're, they're more like um, symptoms of deeper changes that took place. And... Um, I think that what you're doing and the kind of thing you're doing, if, if it proliferates, can transform collective consciousness more profoundly or you know, can accelerate the transformation of collective consciousness. And then all kinds of laws and, and you know, relationships between warring factions and so on will just kind of dissipate. I think that was beautifully said. I have nothing to add to that other than to say thanks for articulating it so well. It's just so... Um, 
it, 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 it's, it's so, I think, helpful when we recognize that, that, um, that way in which as, as the consciousness as now, of course, conssciousness is never actually shifting, but you, you and I know what we're, know what plane we're yeah, talking about. We're not about. talking about the absolute yeah, changing. Exactly. Anyway. We're talking, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so, but, but I always have to preface that if I say like, you know, shifting consciousness, but that as that, as we experience that evolution of consciousness or that shifting in, in consciousness, um, it seems so important to see what the kinds of things you just pointed to the, the women getting to vote, all of that as, as byproducts, um, because it, it's so, uh, to, what that allows us to do is refocus the attention on on the uh, on the heart, really. So as we as we focus the attention on the heart, the natural byproduct is um, policies that don't alienate other people, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. Um, and that is not to say that we can all just sit on our butts and meditate, and then the politicians are just going to wake up one day and make all the beautiful changes we'd like to see them make and so on. I think, you know, you have to sort of be multi-dimensional in your approach to this stuff and you need to vote and you need to, you know, engage in various sorts of activism that, are, that you're passionate about, like you were saying, animal rights and, and things like that. All that stuff needs to be done. Uh, but no one component is sufficient unto itself. You know, all, all the different levels of that one can, from from sitting eyes closed, meditating to getting out there and joining a protest or something. They all have their relevance on their own respective levels. Yeah, and and imagine if all of the forces for change were were united through the recognition of our shared being. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, folks over working in the environmental field are, are coming from this deep recognition and folks working over with, inst you know, institutionalized racism are coming from this recognition. It would create a very different quality um, to the change that we actually do already see um, happening around us. I think that's kind of happening. I, I, a few years ago, I interviewed Pro Proctor and Kimberly Gamble, <laughs> from who made the Thrive movie, and uh, we were talking about how back in the '60s, you know, there was the meditators who just sat and meditated and thought all these, you know, Vietnam War protesters were crazy and, and that they weren't going to accomplish anything. And then there were the, the activists and protesters who thought that the meditators were escapists. And <laughs> and now it's more like you know, there's a marriage between activism and spirituality. In fact, the term spiritual activism is in vogue, and there are mm -hmm. people who kind of have recognized that both are insufficient without, without the other. Yeah, I, I, I think as you said before, you know, it's, uh, I think you pointed to the way in which it's not lasting change if it's just coming on that level. I mean, we've, we saw that with the last administration and then this administration. It's like, oh, okay, this guy signed this, so I'll unsign this. I right. mean, it's just like, it, it, if, if you're, if you can step back to find the comedy in it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's comedy. I mean, it's a tragic yeah, comedy, but... Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, I think we made that point. Um, so, how do people plug into what you're doing? Obviously, they could support it financially, I imagine. Um, and but you also teach. I mean, your your whole schools thing. But you also like have you teach retreats and and things like that. So, if people are inspired by this and want to plug into what you're doing more, yeah. what do they do? They would go to caberlymorgan.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have, uh, I'll be leading uh, two different, actually three retreats this summer. And um, then the, our winter retreats listed, but the registration's not up for that mm -hmm. yet. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm going to be doing a collaborative. Is it mostly on the West Coast? R let's see, good question. Are those, those 
those four are on the west coast of the United States, mm-hmm. and I'm doing a lot more online these days too. So Sand uh, invited me to do a webinar um, in the new year. My schedule just couldn't fit it in until the new year, right. um, but uh, so I'm I'm doing a lot more teaching beyond the comfort of my own home. So for for years now, um, our Portland community of practitioners has been very strong and very intimate. Um, and it's it's just uh, newer that I've been teaching through other centers as well. So I just finished teaching it against the stream in that community in, uh, in San Francisco and the Insight Meditation Community of Seattle and Charlottesville, Virginia and the New York Zen Center. Um, so I'm starting to bop around just a little bit more as we make a really important transition with Peace in Schools. And that is that I've been the executive director, and then 18 other hats. And I'm now becoming the founder and guiding teacher Mm -hmm. of Peace in Schools. And it's been, it's been, I've been totally willing to play the role of executive director in that, in that organization. Um, And it's pretty liberating for me to be moving in a direction where my, my, my energy can be freed to focus on creating new curriculum, guiding the teachers for Peace in Schools, as well as focusing on teaching adults, which is a great passion. Uh, Peace in Schools is obviously a huge passion and we have, and that's why we have now uh, 14, 13, 14 employees. It's, it's a passion that's been contagious, uh, but, but offering, uh, offering teachings practice to, um, to the world at large, meaning adults as well, is that hasn't dimmed for me. I just haven't been able to have my, my attention on that as fully over the last few years, but it's just now shifting. So, um, so it's, it's actually becoming less and less hard to, to find me on that front um, for those who would wish to. Good. Well, they can go yeah. to cavalymorgan.org, and I'm sure you have some email they can sign up for to be notified yeah. of things. Yeah. So I really love what you're doing, and uh, you, you know, you're a bright light in the world, and uh, the world needs more people like you. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, it's beautiful. Well, I'm very grateful to speak with you today, Rick. And like I said at the beginning, I think what you're doing is beautiful because I think you're, um, you know, in terms of like contributing to that shift in consciousness, I think it's really important that people from all over can um, can access these teachings. You know, one of my my greatest passions that led to peace in schools is for practice the, the awakened teachings not to be reserved for the privileged. And that's really done through means like this, where, you know, folks can um, be anywhere uh, as long as they can get their hands on a way to get online, yeah. which could even happen at a library, really. Sure. Um, can um, These teachings are so much more available and accessible than they used to be. And I think that's an incredible thing. And so I, I just appreciate your, your contribution to that. Yeah, well... As the Beatles said, we're all doing what we can. We're doing what we can. <laughs> out, of, out of love and service. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. So I'll see you in October. Great. Yeah. Yeah. See you at Sand. Yeah. Let me make a couple of wrap-up points. Um, so I've been speaking with Caverly Morgan, and um, this is an ongoing series of conversations, as most of you know. And um, I'll have a page on that gap for Caverly, for her, her interview and links to everything. Um, and then obviously there are hundreds of other interviews that I've done over the years. And um, so if you're not familiar with the site, just go there and poke around through the menus a little bit and you see what we have to offer. It also exists as an audio podcast. Some people like to listen while they commute and things. Um, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time. Until next time. <laughs>